in the broadest sense imaginable, Marxism is a conflict-oriented economic interpretation of history based on the works of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels that developed really into two separate traditions, one political, which aimed to overthrow capitalism in favor of some form of communism, and the other academic, which is much less politically oriented and exists as a form of criticism, an analytical method and theoretical lens that we use to discuss everything from literature and architecture to race, gender, and political economics. Now, why is Marxism conflict-oriented? Well, in their reading of history, Marx and Engels focused on technological innovation and class conflict as the driving forces behind social development and change. And this is a huge simplification, but they argued that all societies move through four stages, uh, primitive communism, slavery, feudalism, and capitalism. Each of those stages is characterized by distinct technological modes of production, and the potential revolutionary forces created by the tension between the wealthy and the poor. For example, in primitive communism, which Marx imagines as a kind of like Stone Age hunter-gatherer society, all productive labor is shared equally by everyone within a tribe. Over time, though, technological innovation, like the domestication of animals and agriculture, leads to more specialized forms of labor, which creates a class-based society. Some people eventually end up having it better off than others, and then create laws to keep themselves in power. That results in class conflict, which benefits those in power, leading to the development of new forms of social organization. So the development of new technology exacerbates class conflict, leading to revolutionary change. Now, in Marxist cultural theory, this interpretation of history was combined with a structural model that divided these societies into two parts in order to better understand and analyze them. There is the base or infrastructure of society, which is composed of the technological means of production, things like industry, land, natural resources, and so forth, as well as the social interactions that relate to economic production, the uh, conversations that you have while buying and selling goods and services or commodities and real estate, whatever, every social interaction you have that relates to economics. Uh, the base supports and is ideologically influenced by the superstructure, uh, the media, the education system, religion, politics, and law, the uh, cultural institutions that inform our identities. In classical Marxist theory, these two things, the base and the superstructure, exist in a constant dance of mutual influence and support. And historically, in Marxist sociology and anthropology, what authors did was apply these different models to different societies using a method that we call Marxist dialectics, which means essentially trying to understand one group in terms of its conflicting interests with the different group in society. Uh, for example, to better understand the bourgeoisie, the uh, factory and business owners, a Marxist critique would begin by studying the ways in which their economic self-interests conflict with the interests of the working class or the proletariat. In that way, the Marxist dialectic basically takes complex social phenomena and boils them down into a binary, focusing on points of conflict and then theorizing the ways in which those conflicts can be resolved or result in the development of new forms of social organization. That's Marxist dialectics in a nutshell. Now, this is a simplification, but these theoretical models were extremely influential in the social sciences. They not only form the backbone of all Soviet anthropology and post-revolutionary Chinese social theory, but also, as a form of academic criticism, influenced a huge number of Western social scientists. Um, so having said that, what are some criticisms of this approach? Well, from an anthropological perspective, one of the major ones is that classical Marxist readings of history were overly deterministic and implied a Eurocentric bias. They took a model of European socioeconomic development and superimposed that model onto non-European societies. That was one of the major attacks used against Marxist anthropology all the way up through the, the 1970s. There were also some pretty serious empirical criticisms. Marx saw uh, social science as a vehicle for effecting political change, right? Which meant that his social theory and the work of many Marxist social theorists was partisan, it was non-objective in its analysis, and that led many critics to question the scientific viability of data collected by Marxist researchers. Now, within the social sciences, these criticisms 
were devastating, and in the second half of the 20th century they led to a systemic change in the way that Western social scientists approached Marxism. Uh, with the rise of postmodernism in particular, there was a kind of gradual generational shift towards authors who um, rejected the kinds of totalizing modernist meta-narratives that were promoted by earlier Marxist theorists, but who also saw in Marxism's emphasis on ideology, power, oppression, and in its economic critique of capitalism, in those things they saw a powerful theoretical tool for studying contemporary liberation struggles. Authors like uh, Judith Butler, Alain Badiou, Slavoj Žižek, and Axel Honneth, to name a few, have uh, selectively adapted and reimagined aspects of Marxist theory and dialectics to study issues like uh, race, gender, labor conflicts, uh, trans rights, and national and religious minority identities. And that's how I would recommend that you understand Marxism as a form of academic criticism today, a diverse uh, theoretical movement with a troubled and complex past that re-emerged uh, as a profound critique of capitalism and the ways in which capitalist modes of exploitation are mirrored in liberation movements around the world. You just watched an excerpt from our two-part series on the top 10 theories in the social sciences. If you're still watching, thank you very much. You should check this series out and, of course, like and subscribe to the channel. At the moment, I'm actually on parental leave, and you can find some information about that on the channel as well, but uh, we'll be uploading some new content periodically over the next few months, and then we'll be back with a bunch of new material at the beginning of July. Uh, until then, I'm wishing each and every one of you the very best of luck, and of course, never stop learning. I'd like to thank my beautiful and amazing Patreon supporters, these wonderful people you see on the screen right now. And if you out there would also like to be a paragon of social scientific education, you can come on over to our Patreon page and give us a look.